Good evening. I hereby call the Palm Springs Special Study Session meeting of March 29, 2022 to order. I invite those who can and would like to to join me in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. City Clerk, could you please call roll? Council Member Holstead? Here. Council Member Kors? Here. Council Member Woods? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Here. Mayor Middleton? Present. All members are present. All right. Uh, this evening we have a special study session on the issue of vacation rentals. It is the only issue that is on our agenda this evening. We have no action items uh, to vote on, but we may give discretion uh, at somewhere during the course of the meeting to uh, staff. Uh, Council Member Woods, would you like to say yes, something? Yes, um, I will have to recuse myself as I have a financial interest in a home share. And although very different than a vacation rental, it's best that I just don't participate in the discussion at this point. Right. Thank you. The next item is public testimony. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the City Council on the study session item only. Two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. Tonight, the City Clerk will be contacting speakers via telephone. Off top data, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Hello from the Hills Department. I've been here for the past decade in the hospitality business. I fully support and in favor of looking at the five-year history of the data for vacation rental since we made major revisions to our vacation rental ordinance in 2017. The ordinance in my opinion, is working. Enforcement is being great because the city gets great job processes, infrastructure, make this ordinance work. You also a great enforcement. So this ordinance works and the post economy coverage the fact that the city action with respect to ordinance changes that you may consider. <clears throat> One more thing I'd like to let everyone know that the inventory at certain of the year because of special demand and on and on that we don't have enough inventory. We try to restrict and cut on too much of the inventory. I can guarantee over a period of time. Mr. Dada, Mr. Dada, your your connection is a little weak. Do you mind if we give you a call back so your comments can come through clearly? Thank you. <clears throat> Luz Delgado, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Thank you. Hello, my name is Luz Delgadillo and I am the director of homeowner experience at Orange Palm Vacation Homes. Having just celebrated 50 years of experience in up close vacation rental management, I wanted to address the non-correlation of citations to the number of stays we have in this beautiful city. If you look at the number of vacation rental stays compared to the number of noise citations, only 0.003% of guest stays in 2021 resulted in a citation. If this sounds like a small number, that's because it is. The amount of disturbances are relatively few in number irrespective of density. The city, the city and the Office of Special Programs Compliance deserve credit for operating an airtight system of enforcement and people are following the rules. That's all I wanted to mention and I appreciate your time. Thank you. I know task forces and committees have been used in the past. 
Mr. Hoban. Uh, it's your turn. Just a moment. Bruce Hoban, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and staff. I am Bruce Hoban, a board member of Vacation Runner, Owners and Neighbors of Palm Springs, or also known as V-Run. We are truly looking forward to a working together to make changes to our vacation rental ordinance. However, there is now a new process in place to make changes to any ordinance. Could we please hear tonight from a city council member or the city manager on the timetable for making revisions to the VR ordinance? I know task forces and committees have been used in the past, but I'd love to know what your expectations of the council are with the new visioning process. Before any discussions involving policy or ordinance changes, right now we only have some of the requested data we can review tonight. When can we expect the rest of the data to be provided for another study session before we really delve down to policy? Looking forward to your answers. Thank you for your time. Mr. Dada, you are live with the City Council. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Aftab Dada from the Hilton Palm Springs. I've been in the city for over three decades, and I fully support and I'm in favor of looking at the five-year history of data since we made major revisions to a vacation rental ordinance in 2017. The ordinance, in my opinion, is working. Enforcement is also working because the city did a great job in creating the processes and infrastructure to make this ordinance work. We've also built a great enforcement team. So this ordinance really works and the post-COVID economic recovery demand that the city be judicious in its actions with respect to ordinance changes that you may consider. One more thing I want everyone to keep in mind that due to certain cities in the Coachella Valley banning vacation rental and knowing that we have some very huge special events that takes place year round, having cut down that inventory of vacation rental might in the long run hurt our industry because if there is no inventory available the promoters are not going to continue to have those events. Thank you for listening to me. Have a great day. David Feltman, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Okay, good evening members of the City Council and staff. Thank you for this time. Um, I laud you for holding this session tonight and examining the data that's been compiled. Uh, one of the issues that will come up in the course of the review of the ordinance is housing issues and housing availability um, and housing prices. And I would like to ask the city council to hold a similar study session on issues related to housing. I think it would be unfortunate if one input, which is Houses related to vacation rentals drives a, a policy change on vacation rentals when the overall housing issues deserve a much more in-depth examination. Several months ago, I personally put in a PRA to try to find out the 10-year history of the council's or the city's approval of planned development projects so I could try to do some research on the size of those projects and the average prices of them. All I can give to you tonight is the anecdotal data, which is listening to the council approve plans when they say at the end, well, how much are these going to cost, they say to the developers, and the answer is 600000 800000 800 to a million. I've heard very few answers that would come into the territory of lower middle income housing. There are two projects in the pipeline. I know about those, but all the rest of them at 800000 a million, $2 million, there's no collected data on those. I would urge you to hold a study session concurrently with these, with this work to make sure we understand the full range of inputs into the housing 
um, conditions and situation in Palm Springs. Thank you. Michael Vallejo, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, having us. Uh, my name is Michael Vallejo. I own Halter Green Vacation Rentals and live in Palm Springs. Um, I just wanted to, to mention, we hear a few people talking about the fact that, you know, other cities have restricted or banned vacation rentals and Palm Springs should be following suit. Uh, I think it's important to remember that we are not other cities. Palm Springs, the city council did a great job of crafting a model ordinance for vacation rentals uh, back in 2017. It's one of the strictest rental, uh, rental ordinances in the country, and we have done a lot of research on this, as you did at the time. Uh, it's been model, it's been used uh, as an example, as a model for other cities around the country, and it's working. Uh, we have a robust enforcement department. Uh, the data shows, the data that was just released by the city shows that there were over 44,000 guest stays in 2021 uh, in vacation rentals, representing over 220,000 visitors to Palm Springs. And out of those more than 44,000 stays, only 130 noise citations were issued. 130 citations out of over 44,000 stays. This, this ordinance works. It is fantastic. And uh, other cities should be copying it. I think that for us to say, you know, we should do what La Quinta did, we should do what Cathedral City did, that's not, that's not the road we want to go down. Palm Springs is unique. They didn't put the enforcement in place. They didn't put the strict ordinance in place that, that our city council so wisely did, and it's working. Thanks very much. Bruce Younger, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Good evening. I want to thank the City of Palm Springs for crafting a well-designed ordinance to manage the issue of vacation rentals, and especially commend the robust enforcement of the ordinance. Because without enforcement, the law is meaningless. While short-term rentals have been a benefit to many, it is also a contributing factor, I believe, to the lack of available housing in the city. Palm Springs is in a serious housing crisis, and it is only getting worse. I personally know two long-term local residents who are currently desperately trying to locate housing after receiving notice from their landlords that their leases are not being renewed. I have never seen it so bad, and I've been in and around this city full of part-time since the 1980s. Short-term rentals are a major reason why the city's population failed to grow since the last census, as the permanent housing stock is being removed and converted over to these units. The short-term rental program needs to be capped. I'm not sure if that should be in total units or in a percentage basis, but it needs to be capped before things get worse. With other desert cities further restricting short-term rentals, the pressure is only going to increase on Palm Springs to pick up the slack. And the city needs to make providing affordable housing the number one priority. I'm tired of hearing about how much money it generates. If that's just all we're going to care about, let's just convert it all to one big Motel 6, and then we'll see this town turn into a soulless, empty place. So please, please consider capping this before it gets totally out of control. Thank you very much. Kenny Cassidy, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Thank you. Good evening, City Council members and staff. My name is Kenny Cassidy. I'm on the board at Iran and work for a vacation rental agency. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight regarding short-term rentals and your study session. It's been suggested that density of permitted short-term rentals in a given neighborhood is a problem. In fact, density and complaints do not go hand in hand. Earlier today, a table was submitted to the council and that table shows density is not a driver of disturbance. The city's data actually shows there's no correlation between density and nuisance. In fact, some of the most permit dense neighborhoods with vacation rentals have the lowest instance of complaint calls, citations, or suspensions. Take Racket Club Estates, for example. Racket Club Estates has a 37% vacation rental density, but just 4% of all citations among the permits in that neighborhood. While it ranks number one in density, it ranks number 26 in citations. 
There are several examples of this, especially in neighborhoods with a higher percentage of second homes, such as Chocolates River Estates, El Rancho Vista Estates, Twin Palms, all with higher density, yet fewer complaints. Across the city, while the total number of permits is up, complaint calls and citations are actually down. Clearly, we need to dig deeper to understand if and where there even is a problem before we can try to change anything in the ordinance. Thank you for your efforts and for your consideration. Francine McDougall, you're live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Thank you. Hi there, my name's Francine McDougall and I've been a vacation rental owner in Palm Springs for over 10 years and I'm also a board member of the Ron PS. I'd like to briefly touch on density for a second. A review of currently suspended vacation rental properties, which are properties that have received three citations in 12 months, shows they are small in number, just nine in 2021. And they're not present in any one neighborhood. In fact, the highest number in one neighborhood is two properties. Also, over the past 18 months, the data shows the city has seen a 23% decline in citations. This decline reflects a near record low in 2021 of 190. Because of these numbers, we know that the ordinance is working but we also know there are some areas that need clarification and we look forward to the opportunity to discuss these with you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, that concludes public comment. Thank you. Study session special item, the agenda now continues with the discussion of short-term vacation rental priorities and processes for short-term vacation rentals in the city. At this time, I would like to invite staff to present their report. Good evening, Council. Tonight, we return to present the data for vacation rentals in Palm Springs. Staff has prepared for you a comprehensive state of vacation rentals report outlining the data that staff maintains. Um, a lot of work went into this report and we hope that it meets the, all of your requests. Before we begin our presentation, there were some data requests that we were unable to prepare at the staff level. Um, I did want to touch on these as I'm sure you noticed they were missing. The heat maps to demonstrate density, total number of second homes used as vacation rentals, what is happening with new homes in comparison to census data, and occupancy rates, average daily rental rate, impact to hospitality, capacity, and housing markets. These items were beyond the data maintained by our staff and available to us. However, at the conclusion of our presentation, should you still require this information or different information, kindly provide staff direction and we will um, do our best to accommodate your request. Um, we'll go ahead and move into the PowerPoint at this point. We'd like to go through our presentation and any questions you have, we can answer at the conclusion. Um, Vacation rentals have been um, regulated here in the city of Palm Springs since 2008 with the introduction of ordinance number 1748. It was revised um, in 2014, 2016, and 2017, which is the current ordinance 1918. Ordinance 19 has become a model vacation rental ordinance, um, not just here locally, it is also across California and the United States. We receive calls daily for our input and feedback on cities that are crafting their ordinances. So we know that it is a strong ordinance that was well written. There are core requirements of the ordinance, which we feel helps to um, helps enforcement. We require permit the each. Um, permit holder also pays transit occupancy, occupancy tax. There's occupancy limits, local response contacts that are required. This is really helpful because there's not an opportunity to correct any um, disturbances. If there's a disturbance, they are cited and that's a strike against the property. Um, we also have a 24 hour vacation rental hotline. We are contracted with Central Communications who operate the hotline. Um, they report all nuisances and disturbances, not just for vacation rentals, but any homes in the city. There's a brief outline of the revisions made over time. A lot of the core requirements have 
always been in place. These were added to enhance enforcement throughout the years. Um, you know, the minimum age for responsible renters was raised from 18 to 25. Um, the prohibition of the outdoor amplified music, lock up trash service, and the registration number required on advertisements. These have been critical in identifying um, unregistered rentals. In 2018, the additional regulations, which are currently in place, um, added further restrictions. It also limited each person to only hold one vacation rental permit. There were some owners who did have multiple and they were allowed to be grandfathered in. Um, those are very few in number. We really spend a lot of staff time to ensure that all registrants only have one permit. There's a limit on the amount of contracts, which is the number of stays that um, individuals can rent their home. We also have a three strike and suspension risk. So when you receive a citation, it is a strike. If you do receive the strikes, your property is suspended. You cannot operate as a short-term rental. You can operate as a long-term should you choose. Um, there is a $5,000 fine and permanent ineligibility to operate a vacation rental for anyone who is found to be operating illegally. There's also a required check-in, meet and greet, and we have a friends and family list for um, homeowners to provide us a list of their friends and families who can stay at their home without having to um, pay the transient occupancy tax. And there's also restrictions on when maintenance can be done to the home so it does not disturb the neighbors. At this time, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Patrick Clifford. He prepared all of this data. He worked really hard um, to go through the numerous um, mechanisms we have to gather it and prepared it so he can best present this to you and answer any questions you have on it. Yes, good evening, uh, Mayor Middleton, Mayor Pro Tem Garner Council. Um, the first data that I would like to discuss with you this evening is regarding our registrant review. Um, as of December 31st, 2021, 97% uh, of the vacation rentals um, were vacation rentals in the, in the city and 3% were considered home shares. Uh, vacation rental owners and agencies must annually apply uh, for a vacation rental permit. On average, our department uh, processes 191 applications monthly. In the staff report on page 12, uh, the table provided is a registrant review and is sorted by the percentage of vacation rentals to the number of households in a specific neighborhood. This table also shows any increase or decrease in vacation rental registrants by neighborhood between 2017 and 2021. Uh, from our information that we uh, gathered, 6% of the homes in Palm Springs are vacation rentals. Uh, department staff reviewed how many active permits uh, in 2017 have remained active in 2021, and we found a count over 1,100. But we also noticed that these may have been properties that although they were active in 2017, may have sold to another owner at a later date and then applied to become a vacation rental. And we can still determine such information, but we need to look over the information just to be as accurate as possible. Also included, um, in the presentation this evening are two maps that council asked for, uh, one um, showing the, uh, the locations of vacation rentals across the city by neighborhoods, and then as well as a density map. If staff could please uh, uh, pull up the saturation map um, on the screen and we can discuss further. A staff the other map if possible, please. So this map will be available in the lobby after tonight's meeting. Uh, what we did, we're working with our IT department. We were able to uh, provide a list of our vacation rentals and apply this to our city's GIS system, and then appropriately put uh, pinpoints of all the locations across the city. The second map that we are able to provide, if uh, staff can bring up our density map, is a map with the same point data, uh, but just converted into a density uh, map. Uh, this density analysis 
was used using the kernel analysis tool. Um, GIS, the GIS team worked um, hard to uh, have this map created. Uh, from my understanding, how the kernel analysis tool works is that it takes the, the point data provided and evaluates it based on how close and how far um, the vacation rentals are in relation to each other. And so how this map is showing is that the darker blue area is considered to be a higher density with relation to how the proximity of vacation rentals and a, and a lighter blue, if not white, is really limited, um, not as dense vacation rentals. Again, this map will be also provided in the lobby after tonight's meeting. If we can please go back to the PowerPoint. Additionally, uh, staff were able to identify that 84% of the vacation rentals are single family residences, 16% are condominiums, and 4% are others such as a commercial property or a duplex multifamily dwelling. Additionally, 6% of the registered properties in the city are considered estate homes, which is a property that has five or more bedrooms. 6%. Uh, Move along to contract summaries. Each uh, vacation rental, excluding home shares, must submit a summary for a guest stay that is 28 days or less. For 2021, uh, we reviewed the median data regarding how many summaries were submitted by each property. For owner-operated op properties, median summaries submitted was 19 and agencies was 20. For both owner-operated and agency-operated properties, we identified how many new summaries were submitted, how many were canceled, and also looked at average length of stay for each stay. Both reviews of owner-operated and agency-operated properties show an average guest length of stay of five days. This is the same table that was provided in the previous slide, uh, but this is for agency-operated contract summaries. We then place total summary submissions into nine buckets, with each bucket consisting of a range of four. This shows where properties fall into with respect to total contracts being used. For example, on this slide, the owner summary slide, we see that 153 properties submitted between at least 33 and 36 contract summaries for the year. And on this slide, we see that 118 agency managed properties submitted between 33 and 36 summaries. Overall, the data shows that 42 neighborhoods with a, con uh, with a contract summary, summary submitted to the city, a median of 19 to 20 stays for each property, and little over 44,000 summaries submitted in 2021. On this slide, it shows a snapshot of a table that is included in the staff report on page 16. And this table shows a breakdown of contract summaries for each neighborhood and an average based on registered permits in the neighborhood. The next data in the report is regarding our vacation rental hotline. The hotline provides information on each call that comes in and categorizes these calls as an active nuisance or a non-active nu nuisance, regardless of if the property is a registered vacation rental or not. An active nuisance may include music at a property, loud occupants, or a trash concern. A non-active nuisance includes calls that are referred to the office or the website and usually contain requests on how to apply for a permit or what time the office opens, but also includes hangups or disconnected calls. This report this evening focuses on active nuisance calls only. Out of the total active nuisance calls received, 76% of the calls were active nuisances at a registered vacation rental. Looking at the active nuisance calls that were called into the hotline specifically for vacation rental properties, calendar year 20, 20 received the most calls at 991, and this past year, 2021, 
received the fewest calls, calls at 576. The department also looked at active nuisance calls by year and quarter, and while calls are received throughout the year, quarter two, which is April, May, and June, received the most. The slide also includes active nuisance calls that were not associated with the registered vacation rental. And for reference, a table was provided in the staff report on page 18 that shows a breakdown of active nuisance calls to a registered vacation rental by neighborhood. The department also, looked, also took the information from the hotline and looked at which days of the week received the most. 75% of the calls occurred between Friday and Sunday, with most being on Saturday. The department broke down the calls into four blocks of time across a 24-hour time period. What the data has shown is that most calls are received between 6 p.m. and midnight, followed by noon to 6 p.m. This slide is similar to the previous slide, but shown in a percentage. As shown, close to 40% of the calls are received between 6 p.m. and midnight. Lastly, with respect to the hotline, the department broke down the data down by time and by day. This data shows us that the highest percentage of calls occur on Saturdays between noon and midnight. The city provides residents multiple resources to report nuisance concerns regarding vacation rentals. Residents can report concerns through the hotline, uh, the city's My Palm Springs app, or call the police non-emergency line. The citation data provided reflects, reflected in this report um, reflects citations issued to vacation rentals from all of these sources. In calendar year 2021, 190 citations were issued by code compliance officers, a decrease of 55% from 2018, and a decrease of 23% from 2020. Code compliance officers issued the most citations in 2018 um, with 425 citations issued. The most common of all violations found is ap amplified sound audible at the property line. Here we have citations issued by year. As shown, the most citations were in calendar year 2018. Included in the staff report on page 23 is a table that breaks down by year citations issued in each neighborhood. This table on the slide references five neighborhoods that in total between 2017 and 2021 received the most citations. Staff reviewed citations issued uh, for amplified noise by year. 2020 was the year where most amplified noise citations were issued. This data also includes violations where multiple violations were found. For example, music audible at the property line and over the permitted limit of vehicles. The department took the citation data and identified the five most common violations found. Music or amplified noise at the property line is the most common and operated, operating without a vacation rental permit is the second most common violation. The vacation rental ordinance has language with respect to violations found at a property. If a property receives three citations within a 12 month period, the vacation rental permit is suspended for a two year period. Currently, the department has 14 properties suspended. The department is currently analyzing and looking at data regarding citation by neighborhood and including the type of citation issued. But this information may include larger data sets 
and may be appropriate to look at individually. Lastly, the department is looking to review complaints received towards citations issued, but the department needs to further analyze this data to make sure that complaints from all sources, including the My Palm Springs app and Palm Springs Not Emergency, are included in this review. Thank you, Council, for your time. And that concludes my portion of this, and I'll be available for any questions at the, the end of the presentation. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to go over um, our transient occupancy tax in relationship to vacation rentals. Um, every operator is required to have a TOT permit, our transient occupancy tax permit. Every month, they have to remit that tax to the city. The current rate for the transient occupancy tax is 11.5%. In July of this year, an additional 1% Tourism Bureau Improvement District tax was imposed on our vacation rental homes. The funds are used specifically for marketing and destination program development. Funds are deposited in the community pressure fund and general fund and used for a variety of expenditures throughout the city um, that benefit the community. Here is an overview of the TOT received from fiscal year 1617 through 2122 um, year to date. So you can see the amount that was generated with 2021 um, at $15 million collected in TOT. This is just a graph that demonstrates that same information, and you can see the increase that was um, that we have experienced here in the city. So that um, does conclude our presentation. If you had any questions, we are here to answer them for you. Our, it is, is it the pleasure of the council to jump? Uh, first into questions, or do we want to do questions and comments together? Questions first? All right. Then let's try to re uh, do that. Uh, I see the Mayor Pro Tem jumping uh, right up, so let's start there. Thank you. Uh, Veronica, I'm a little bit confused about our home share and vacation rentals. So for vacation rentals, right, it's or I'm sorry, let's see, for home shares, it has you. the owner has to be on property during the stay. Is that correct? Correct. So the home share, they're renting out either um, a portion of their home, two bedrooms, one bedroom, or they have a casita um, that they're renting, but they're in the home the entire stay. So if I had a house and I wanted to rent my house while I was out of town, that would be considered a vacation rental? Correct, if the stay was 28 days or less. Okay. How many of our, you know, 2,000 vacation rentals are owner-occupied vacation rentals? 64. 64 only. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wait, so, okay, so I'm a little bit confused. So, so I'm still confused okay. because if there's a difference... By definition of our ordinance, every vacation rental is a second residence because the spirit of the ordinance states that a vacation rental is a secondary and ancillary use. So it's defined as a their secondary home. We can do a deeper dive, but it was difficult to determine how many were occupied by the owner um, primarily, and they only rented one week their entire house to some guests. We just didn't have the data available to gather this quickly, but we can if you'd like us to return with that. Okay, that's that's something I'm interested in because I saw in here that there were, you know, about 280 that were only used for, only had four stays or less. And so I would be interested to know if those 280 homes, are they sitting vacant except for, you know, a couple of times a year or is it that the owner lives there and then only goes out of town twice a year, and that's when they rent them. So I think that would be helpful for me, because one of the concerns that I have is how many vacant properties right. are, are, do we have in our city? We do have many properties that rent seasonal. So they will rent for six months of the year, and the other six months do part-time. So that's another factor when you see those numbers. Okay, thank you. So that, that is something in the future that I think would be really helpful so that we can get an understanding of um, really what we're looking at here, because I think a lot of people have this idea that vacation rentals are only used for vacation rental purposes the entire year, but if there's people who are here six months out of the year as, you know, part-time residents, that I think that's a, okay. a good distinction that we need to know. 
Other questions? Council Member Halstead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If I can just ask a follow-up question. Um, thank you for that question, Mayor Pro Tem. I think that's really interesting too. And yeah, maybe one way we could get there is the number of contracts, but we also collect the owner data, right? So we would have the address of the LLC or the individual trust or the individual owner and sort of if they're using their rental at that home, you know, that's their primary residence versus if it's an out of town investor or something like that. We have that information in general, right? Yes, we could gather that. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that. I'm really interested in knowing uh, when it comes to vacation rentals, how many of them uh, have a owner who is in residence uh, for multiple months of uh, the year? And uh, uh, I'm not sure how to accurately get that information, but uh, I think that's something we need to know. We can work on that for you. Are there other questions? Well, I want to commend uh, you for the data that came back to us. We, uh, a couple of weeks ago, asked you for a tremendous amount of, uh, of data. And uh, we got back uh, some really very well organized information that was very, very helpful. Uh, I would like to follow up on one question that has surfaced to me, and that's in the housing profile uh, at the end of the report, where largely we seem to be using 2010 census data. Uh, at what point do we believe 2020 census data will be available? Um, Patrick, did you want to? Patrick is the one who gathered that information. We okay. did diligently search for it. Um, the 2010 was the most recent available to us. Um, I don't. Do you have an answer? Yes. Thanks for the question, Mayor Middleton. Yeah, the data that we have for the housing was 2010. Um, I don't have any information. On, when or where I can get the 2020, but I am really interested in getting that, and I'll look to see if I can include that in our next report. Could you could you do some follow up and uh, and report back to us? Uh, this is not the first time that uh, in public policy requests around 2020 uh, census data has been asked, and the issue is the uh, Department of Census really has been very slow, uh, and we all know that. Uh, Council Member Course. Uh, great, thank you, Mayor. Um, so one one data that uh, I think we've seen before, and this in here, that six percent of all housing has a vacation rental permit, um, but we we don't allow them in apartments. Most condos or a lot of condos don't allow them at all. A lot of homes and HOAs don't allow them at all. We can see that in some of the neighborhoods. Um, so of the and we don't allow them in multifamily homes, except duplexes if one is owner-occupied. So right. we have very few of those, as we can see. So looking at the single-family homes, do we have a sense what percentage are now vacation rental permitted? Or do we not? We don't really know how many single-family homes we have yet, right? We do not have that information that. available. It was just okay. the timeline was difficult to gather that. But right. again, this is additional information that we can yeah. work with outside agencies to obtain. Right. So. I think it's fair to assume we have a lot more than 6% of single family homes have vacation rental permits, given all the ones that are not allowed to have them, right? So just for the public to understand that distinction, um, which is why we see some neighborhoods with the saturation yes. we do, uh, which are mostly single family home neighborhoods. Um, and I don't know if you don't know this, that's fine, but um, I know we had 271 you shared that were operating without a certificate. And um, so, the owners of those homes, unless there was a finding that they actually weren't breaking the rules, um, are permanently suspended from having a vacation rental in Palm Springs, correct? Correct. Okay. I just want the public to know that. And as far as I know, the vast majority, if not close to all, that was the penalty for them. Is that Correct. Uh, this past year, there were 13 uh, properties that were founded that appealed, and all of them were upheld, so they're permanently ineligible. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that, and thanks. This is really this is really helpful to go through ahead of the meeting, and um, how quickly you pulled this much data together in a way that was so easy to follow is amazing. So thank you both so much for your work on this.
There was a data point that uh, I was looking for that uh, I reached out to individuals in the industry, and what I was told is that in Palm Springs we have 5,400 hotel rooms, and within the 2,300 vacation rentals, we have 6,908 uh, bedrooms. Uh, I know that our data uh, on vacation rentals includes the number of bedrooms that we believe is be is allowed. So I have no reason to uh, to doubt the accuracy of these numbers, but uh, diligence says we should verify. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, so I would ask, uh, both with the number of hotel rooms, the number of bedrooms uh, total, that gives us a sense of uh, what our capacity is in the town at any given time. If these numbers are, are correct, and I believe they are uh, very close to being correct, uh, then something uh, better than half of the rooms available for rent in our city are vacation rentals. Uh, Mr. Dada made note of this, but uh, most of our hotels are occupying right now at very close to 100% capacity. If that is true, uh, then any elimination of rooms uh, from vacation rentals uh, would necessarily be uh, f fewer rooms available uh, for uh, those who want to visit our city. And I think, uh, I know people feel very strongly one way or another on that issue, uh, but we need to be at least honest with ourselves uh, that uh, any reduction means a reduction in availability of people to come to our city. Are there other questions that folks have? Because we, we, it's just four of us, so we can go back and forth a little bit. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I like going back and forth better as you say things. It uh, triggers questions for me. Do you have a sense, and by the way, the report is ex very, very excellent, um, really, really good work pulling together all this data in a digestible, clear way for the public. It's a really amazing report and presentation that you did, so thank you for that. Um, I'm wondering if you looked at um, the demand. This is a supply and it's a demand issue, right? So sort of the demand of what we're seeing in terms of applications submitted and how long it takes, you know, and what we're seeing in terms of the um, increase, if there is one, in applications for permits um, and what those trends are. And you might not be able to answer that offhand. I know that wasn't one of the data points um, Necessarily, but I'm just wondering your sense in that. If we know our housing market's on fire, we know yes. that house, California and our region's in a housing crisis. So there's so many factors here, and I'm just trying to get a handle on like what's that demand side for vacation rentals right now or um, over time. Yes, thank you. Great question. In fact, uh, I am pulling up the information because we did uh, take a snapshot of as of today how many new applications we have in queue uh, as far as uh, vacation rentals go. And I'm trying to get it right here. I had it listed, but um, bear with me one moment. Pull it, but I believe it was 76 new applications we have in queue right now just for new um, applications. And on top of that, we have over, uh, we process monthly average 100 and plus applications um, just to renew on an annual basis. So as far as what we've just noticed in conversation in staff, we have noticed that uh, we are receiving an increase of uh, vacation rental applications. Um, and are these new properties uh, that are not been vacation rentals? Um, what we've seen most of is a lot of homes that were vacation rentals that have sold and now are still continuing to be vacation rentals. Right. And, um, and But that's just kind of conversation in the office. Uh, we, we would most likely be able to get some more data to kind of give you actual data on what those numbers be. But, you know, just from plainly speaking in the office, that's what we've noticed. 
Yeah, because I think it's interesting, the input and the output, right? So how many are coming in? We kind of have had this conversation with cannabis projects. Like how many are coming in? What's that demand? How many are approved? How many are in the hopper? And then looking for those trends to know, you know, because overall we haven't had a very large increase um, over time since 2017 in a way that maybe I would have predicted there'd be a lot more. So, and I know council has questions about our census numbers and how we have an added population, even though we have, um, developed homes. And I know Mayor Pro Tem Garner raised the question of vacancy, which I have as well. And I thought that that vacancy, excuse me, that housing report from 2010 was really, instructive and I also was um, interested in those 2020 numbers too because then we can look at the overall vacancy and and understand the supp uh, supply side of housing in our city thank you All right. other questions for for staff well we're, we're gonna be making some comments and I'm sure that may generate a question or two so don't go too far um, this was uh, some fascinating uh, data that came to us, and uh, I want to kick it up, the conversation off, if I may, with one observation that I made in looking through the data, uh, and this goes back to uh, pages 12 and 13 in the report, which identify the number of properties uh, by neighborhood, uh, but what I was also taken by was beyond just simply the density numbers. During the five years since we passed the ordinance in 2017 making revisions, we've grown in the city by a total of 410 new uh, registrations. But if we take just seven neighborhoods in Palm Springs, Racket Club Estates, Tokwitz River Estates, Sunrise Park, Desert Park Estates, Gene Autry, Ranch Club Estates, and Vista Norte. Those seven neighborhoods count for 270 of the 410 new uh, registrations that we had during the course of five years. Uh, and what they are uh, have in common is, uh, in large part, they are neighborhoods of single-family homes, an awful lot of mid-century moderns, not exclusively uh, mid-century moderns, uh, lot sizes a bit smaller than in some other uh, neighborhoods, and affordability in comparison to some other neighborhoods would place them uh, more typically to the middle or maybe even slightly below the middle. Now let's take seven other neighborhoods that are generally identified as uh, uh, less uh, accessible because of cost. Vista Las Palmas, Old Las Palmas, Movie Colony, Mesa, Deepwell, Indian Canyons, and Andreas Hills. During the course of five years, there are a total of 14 more vacation rentals in those seven neighborhoods. And two of the neighborhoods even saw a decline in the number of vacation rentals. I think it, uh, it's hard not to come to the conclusion uh, that uh, the, a significant number of the vacation rentals that are new in the last five years are investors going into communities where uh, there's the greatest opportunity to get in at uh, what they would consider to be a reasonable cost uh, and make a convert uh, either a conversion into vacation rental or continuation into vacation rental, but. Uh, it's a part of the market uh, that I think all of us are concerned about because it has an impact uh, not only in that market, but uh, affordability below. Uh, so it's going to be for, the, for that reason. And I, I know there's a lot more data that we need to be looking at, but uh, uh, 
measures that would uh, help us uh, be more protective and slow some of the growth uh, in some of these areas, I think is warranted. And I'll continue on with one more uh, set of comments. Uh, back in 2017, one of the measures that was uh, passed in uh, Council Member Coors and Council Member Roberts at the time did incredible work on this, was a requirement that uh, um, going forward, no one could own more than one home. And that was specifically addressed uh, at trying to minimize the number of uh, individuals that were coming into ownership uh, solely or overwhelmingly for investment purposes, as opposed to what uh, we've all heard about, uh, individuals that uh, buy a home in Palm Springs, plan to live in Palm Springs on a part-time basis as they transition into full-time living in our community. Uh, those kinds of things ha do happen in Palm Springs. They happen in resort communities across the country where individuals take and do that. Um, I think we may need to beef up some of our uh, restrictions on uh, who can uh, purchase in order uh, to better protect that it is individuals who have some stake in the community in terms of planning to live here uh, for some period of time. And one proposal that I have considered would be going forward a requirement that any new permit can only be issued to an individ individual who is going to live in Palm Springs for at least three months of every year going forward. Those are my mouthfuls, so if anyone else wants to jump in. The study sessions are interesting because I think um, it's very reflective, right? We, don't, <laughs> we know we don't have to make a vote right now. It's a slower paced conversation. Um, I think for me the, the, the biggest thing is that housing aspect and it is very telling when we see that the neighborhoods that have the most increase are neighborhoods that were used to be, you know, moderately priced homes in our city. Um, Desert Park Estates was where I probably 90% of the families of the kids lived when I grew up here. Um, and it is just full of vacation rentals now. And in its was something where you thought, okay, people will retire and maybe they'll move out of their homes and then maybe their children will be able to come back to the community or maybe other young families will be able to move in. But that hasn't been the case because there's cash offers on homes because uh, it is investors that come in. Uh, it's not someone, not most, it doesn't seem to be a lot of individuals like Mayor Middleton said who are, who are trying to have a um, small investment because they love Palm Springs and they live in Palm Springs part of the time. Uh, and that's the kind of data and information that I'm also interested in is just how do we determine just how much vacation rentals have impacted our housing market. I think with the bans that we're seeing across the Coachella Valley, um, it's kind of hard to say because they've, they've all been so recent. So we really don't know how that's going to change uh, the market, obviously Palm Springs has the highest home prices, but that's been the case, you know, forever in the Coachella Valley, regardless of whether or not there were vacation rentals. Um, so as we move forward, that's the kind of information I do want to see. What is the impact to Cathedral City now that they've, they're phasing out their vacation rentals? Um, are we going to see better home uh, prices, uh, lower, which is really lower home prices? Um, there. 
Because for me, this this is all about housing and making sure that our, our residents and any new residents actually have a place to live. Um, I know that noise is important to a lot of people and I don't want to discount that, but uh, the priority for me is, is the housing stock that we have. Um, and I, I'm very interested in, in something similar to what Mayor Middleton said in terms of limiting who can have vacation rentals. Um, I am interested in a moratorium for now as we, as we discuss this issue. I think it's, um, it, it's tough to, because it takes time to go through all of this and to make changes, I, I don't want this to continue to go from 2,000 vacation rentals to 2,500 and so on while we're figuring out <laughs> how we want to proceed. So I do think a, a moratorium would be helpful. Um, and I also don't want for our long-term residents to not, and, and not just long-term, but our, our full-time residents to, to not be able to take advantage of vacation rental market in the future for their own success. Um, we have a lot of people that are here that are interested in vacation rentals for their homes in the future. You know, maybe they will um, need to relocate for work and they want to be able to have a vacation rental or, or maybe the same thing, talking about going on vacation and renting out their homes um, part of the time. If we, I don't want to be so punitive to the point that those residents can't take advantage of those opportunities. So I think that um, they should be able to, especially because of people's means and, and abilities to host change over time. Um, so that, that's my, my initial thoughts on this. And I do appreciate all of the information and understand that a lot of the information that I've raised today is, is difficult <laughs> uh, data to, to find. Uh, so I do hope that we can get some of it in the future. Um, and if there is information that we're, or data points that we aren't able to get, if we could just distinguish that as well at the next, the next meeting and, um, so that we can understand why that information isn't available and then and go from there. Council Member Kors. Uh, great, thank you. Um, yeah, that, I guess one question, um, Justin, because I think one of the things it sounds like we're all interested in if, you know, if we look at both agency and owners of the 2200 vacation rentals, 515 are rented four or less times. Um, 837, 12 or less, so like 40% are rented once a month or significantly less. I don't know, is it possible to find out um, what's happening with those houses, houses the rest of the time? Are the people living there? Are they doing long-term seasonal rentals? Are they sitting them totally vacant? Is that data we can get? Because it would be, I think, helpful for us if we could. I just yeah. wonder if it's possible. I, I think getting aggregate census data and looking at trends between um, 2010 and 2020 is likely by the time they roll out all of the data. I think starting to associate that with individual properties would likely require us doing something more proactive on our end to collect information. So that could include moving forward, making a disclosure of that kind of information uh, required as part of getting a permit. Um, or we could administer some sort of survey instrument in hopes that we get enough participation that the results are generalizable. But I do think it might be difficult to get that from any other objective source. I don't know of a source that has that kind of information readily available, right? So we'd be trying to get it from the owners themselves in some way, shape, or form. If, if it was important moving forward, it really seems like making it uh, contingent on the permit would be the best way, but that might not help us looking backward. And you know, when you, and you look at the other end, right? You know, we've almost 25% are renting 25 to 36. Um, you know, 269 of the homes, you know, is 33 to 36. Um, I know I advocated 26 as um, the maximum number of contracts, because I think it starts when people are renting it out, and if the average is five days each that much, I just think this is the secondary use of the house, right? And that's sort of what our ordinance says, is this is the secondary use of the house, it's not the primary use. And we don't really have a way we've been judging that or a way to tell, um, but you know, someone was just telling me um, in our most saturated neighborhood, they just bought full-time resident for many years, they just bought a home there because they figure they can rent it out the max times and make money and it's a good investment. 
that clearly is against what our ordinance allows, but we don't have any way that we do anything about that currently in the ordinance. So I'd like, you know, um, some brains thinking about that in the future. What do we do when people are really, these houses have not, are primarily being used as a vacation rental. It's a secondary use. Uh, it's not the secondary use anymore. And because that's, you know, it's very different. If someone's renting it out five, six times, and the rest of the time, you know, they're doing seasonal or they're living there, and this helps them pay their mortgage, and I know people have done that. You know, they go on vacation usually in April and rent out the house for two or three weeks uh, during Coachella and Stagecoach, and they cover a lot of their mortgage. Otherwise, they couldn't live here, mm -hmm. right? Including people who work here. They take their vacations deliberately. Mm. You know, I wouldn't want to, you know, see us cap those, right? But is there a total number of houses we'd want that are renting it more than that? Um, you know, so that's one of the issues just that I think we want to come up with, right? Is there a number, and same for neighborhoods, because, um, you know, some of the neighborhoods, um, especially smaller lots, when they start getting that condensed, are going to have more complaints. And it's not always the case. And maybe, you know, when you get to 40% saturation, how many people are left to complain? Um, you may get less complaints, right? Because it's mostly become, you know, it's half a vacation rental neighborhood. I don't think we want to see a 50% neighborhood. I don't think we want to see more than a 20% neighborhood. So, um, but again, if it's four rentals, I wouldn't feel that. And that's where, to, I don't know that we can get that data, but um, we could lim you know, have more permits that are fewer if we were going to do some kind of cap, right? Where if you're renting it six times or less, everyone should be able to do that, right? Because that's not a profit-making business at that point. Um, one other thing um, that I want to throw out uh, which I know Mayor Pro Tem Garner and I have talked about and raised mm -hmm. numerous times um, over the last year and a half, is something that prohibits a home getting a permit for a period of time, I'm thinking two years, after someone who was not a short-term renter mm -hmm. was evicted. Uh, and, you know, I know there are places, right, if you um, take the house off the market, right, you can't then put it back on the market for five years as a rental as a way to avoid people losing eviction so someone could make a profit. And I'd really like to see us do something on that sh quicker. I don't know how many there are, but I think we've all heard of situations where someone who was a long-term renter was evicted and it turns into a vacation rental. Uh, and that is a real concern because you know, we want people not to risk losing their house for that purpose um, if they're renters, I, I would think. Um, and the other thing is just, you know, continuing to have robust enforcement. That's how this is working. Uh, and, you know, finding the people that we're still finding people who are renting illegally, um, you know, that we need to stop because we don't know it's a vacation rental. Um, they're sort of undercutting the whole system. And uh, I'm glad those numbers are going down, but they still exist. And I appreciate all the work that goes into finding those folks. So those are just my general, general comments. Councilmember Halsage. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I share the concern about the rental market and the supply of affordable and attainable housing. Um, we've just seen housing prices for sale spike um, and rental prices go up um, significantly over the last five years. That is happening throughout California. Um, and so I think what we need to do is really think about and look at the long-term data um, for the housing market. Um, I'm really interested in like multifamily development um, and what we can do to um, increase supply. I mean, fundamentally, this is a supply question. Um, and you know, my question is if we were to do a ban, which I don't support and I don't think voters support, if all of those units came online, would that reduce uh, the housing cost in Palm Springs or would other um, investors buy it for their other second home? I mean, we've always been a tertiary or secondary market. We've always had out of town, um, you know, seasonal renters, seasonal owners. Um, and so I think it's just a question of like causation and, and in, you know, impacts to the market. Um, but I share, I very much share the concern about gentrification. Uh, Mayor Middleton pointed out some of the neighborhoods, um, which that was really 
instructive. Thank you, Mayor. Um, some that I pointed out for myself when reading this was Demuth Park, which is a historically um, lower income neighborhood in the city of Palm Springs or veterans tract. Um, communities of color, some people who've been here um, for you know generations. In 2017, that was 38, <clears throat> and now it's 91. Uh, so that's almost tripling the number. Lawrence Crosley, there were two in 2017, or two in 2018, four in 2019, and then nine uh, in 2021. And then same thing, Desert Highlands Gateway, one or one 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 for 2017, 2018, 2019, and then nine in 2021. And so those are really small numbers. So you can't say it's, you know going up by nine <laughs> times. Um, but those to me are concerning trends about gentrification <clears throat> and uh, pushing out long-term residents and families in our community. So I also care about uh, tenant protections for long-term tenants. Um, you know, I know some cities have done you know, tenant relocation assistance um, for no-fault evictions, like if you're being evicted because they changed the use, um, other tenant protections, you know, because if investors are coming in and making $50,000, $100,000 in profit on a home and then pushing out residents and the tenant, you know, has nowhere to go and then the prices are double or triple somewhere else. Um, and this, most of my comments about this are about the housing crisis. And that, again, I think the impacts we really need to analyze because some cities like Ranch Mirage, actually, I think we could look at Palm Desert because they've banned for a long enough time now that we could look and see, you know, what are their impacts to their rental or their housing market. I think what we'll see is those are still going up a lot and we probably couldn't piece out a difference for the cities. Um, and again, are we just gonna lose out on TOT because you know those are gonna be vacant? Um, but those are the data questions that we can um, try to pull out um, because I am worried about vacancy. I know, remember, uh, Council Member Fote said when <clears throat> the council first approved this ordinance um, that before it, she actually said she'd rather have vacation rentals on her street than vacant homes. And if you can remember back in 2010 or earlier, you know, in one of the recessions that we faced, so many vacant homes and that not being a contribution to the community, right? So it's a balance there of, you know, if we do limits, is it just going to go to vacancy and other investors or is it truly going to go to long-term tenants, which is what we really want. Um, you know, other cities have done like incentives for workforce housing or incentives for landlords to uh, rent out long term. So, you know, I think like our housing policy would be how to really incentivize long term housing rentals and um, supply side, just, you know, building more housing. Um, so those are kind of the the comments that I have, um, <clears throat> I am interested in like what the public process is for these conversations. I know Council Member Kors is the only one who was here when the council decided in 2017. I know you're an instrumental part in that ordinance and how it was written. So, you know, how can we engage in the with the realtors and some of the other stakeholders and talking about what are the drivers for the housing crisis in Palm Springs and, you know, what are the ways that we can influence that? Um, that's what I'm, I'm interested in. Um, but I, you know, I'm interested in all the questions that council raised and looking forward to a, a discussion with all the stakeholders. Council member Kors. Yeah. I do want to note, um, because when we went through a very challenging time during COVID, how TOT from vacation rentals was so important when the hotels were closed um, and how much we would have had a cut otherwise. And it looks like it's on track for another around $15 million a year, which is 10 plus percent of our budget. Um, and just an awareness, right, that banning them, which some people have always wanted, um, cutting out 10% of your budget uh, with all the things that our community wants us to do, all right, more public safety and more parks and more pickleball and tennis courts. And I mean, the list is endless. Um, and, you know, we want to hasten road repairs. Um, 
there, there are real impacts, right, uh, when you make that kind of cut. And I appreciate the calls. It isn't all about money, right? But money is a big factor in how you run a city. And without it, you have to make tough decisions. Um, and that doesn't mean you don't make changes to address concerns. You do. But I just want, you know, that's in the staff report. I don't think it went into detail in the report, so in the oral presentation. So I want to make sure just to highlight um, that for the public. Um, and I, so from a staff perspective, you know, I'm thinking we're throwing some broad concepts, right, out. Um, and so what is most helpful? I mean, it sounds, right, this has been a suggestion of maybe we don't issue permits as we're trying to figure stuff out. Suggestion of maybe it's a working group that includes, mm -hmm. right, residents, including neighborhood organizations, right, at the table with people who have their own homes that they rent and the agencies that rent um, and the realtors, you know, sort of as a working group to look at this. Uh, so I'm just thinking like, I mean, I'm, I could get into, you know, lots more detail of some ideas I have, but it doesn't sound like we're quite at that stage. So I'm just sort of curious, Mayor, if you have thoughts on how we move this forward or the city manager or both of you. Uh, Justin, do you want to offer any comments at this point? Sure. Um, certainly continued process by way of a working group and engagement of stakeholders makes sense to me, especially in the areas where uh, some of the policy direction might be a little more ambiguous. So for instance, if there was interest in trying to really solidify that this activity would be more of a secondary use instead of a primary, that's a, a pretty broad open-ended area that we could explore. In other instances, if we were to consider something like a cap in neighborhoods, again, that's much more straightforward. So it might be um, eventually up to council to kind of assess and decide where that cap should be. But even that we could take to a working group to you know, at least vet where we think um, you know, numbers might fall and, and the rationale and to kind of vet that further. So I think that strikes me as a good way to both get engagement and to kind of flesh out some of the detail with some of these issues a little more. But that said, still helpful that if council is fairly resolved in certain concepts, like a cap or ex exploring certain areas that many of you have touched on individually, um, and some have agreed, but we, we maybe want to revisit and make sure that there's broader consensus. All of that direction helps to, to keep that working group and any other stakeholder, enga stakeholder engagement focused. What I think I'm hearing from uh, my colleagues is uh, we've got some broad directions, but we'd like more data, more information, more feedback before narrowing down to specific policy uh, recommendations. Is, is that accurate? So, and perhaps what would be useful uh, moving forward this evening is to flesh out some of that very broadly uh, uh, and not try to get too uh, specific with proposals that would then allow uh, Justin and the team to engage with stakeholders and come back to us uh, with uh, uh, recommendations that would uh, allow us to uh, have some policy choices as we uh, implement uh, this. It would also give some more time. Uh, I think it'd be really helpful uh, to be reaching out broadly to individuals who are a part of uh, the real estate market, the vacation rental uh, industry, neighborhood groups, and those who uh, uh, very strongly believe that vacation rentals are not an appropriate uh, use in our, our city. We need to engage a conversation that's broad-based. Uh, one concern I have, uh, if I heard the number correctly, we've got 76 applications in process right now. Uh, that compares with an increase uh, from 21, 2021 to 2022 of only uh, 30 properties. And it is not unusual when uh, subject matter such as this gets uh, set for the agenda uh, that there is a ramping up of people um, buying properties and trying to get in before we make any uh, changes. I would not want to impact anyone who is currently in escrow. 
Uh, but I also am really nervous about triggering some kind of mass uh, increase in properties being purchased and applications being made in the next uh, weeks or months as we are debating these issues. Uh, and uh, this would be a question for uh, the city attorney, but what what opportunities do we have to take and uh, make a statement along the lines of uh, we will be accepting uh, applications for properties currently in escrow, but not accepting applications going forward while we are studying this issue for properties that are not currently in escrow? Um. If the council gives us direction, we can certainly bring back a moratorium ordinance that would be effective immediately. Um, and you could set parameters like that in that type of a, a moratorium, if the council would like. Is that something we, we would have uh, the opportunity to vote on at our next city council meeting? We could probably make that work. Uh, the, the agenda deadline uh, for that is going out on Thursday. But if the council directs us to, we could put that together. The ordinance itself may not be available by Thursday, but we could certainly put the staff report uh, together and have it have it before the council next by next Thursday if you directed us to. Okay. Council Member Kors. I have a question, um, Veronica or Patrick. So I can ask it, and then one of you can get up. Um, so Stacey, if you want. So of those thirty-one, do you have? And I thought I think you didn't, but if you do, are those homes that? Are vacation rentals that are simply transferring ownership, or are those new people who have never the house has never not been a vacation rental before? And you're uh, speaking res with respect to who we have in the queue right now. Yeah. Become uh, they're not transfers. Yeah, these would be new applications. Thirty one. Okay, or new. Okay, no, that's helpful information to know. What Is was it? the number you said? That's in the queue. I believe it was seventy six. I can definitely get you the accurate number. I was just recalling off conversation we had. Um, earlier today. And how long, I'm sorry, Mayor, I can just jump in. ADD things. Um, so how long do they stay in the queue? Our current um, application um, period is 90 days right now. So we'll process that application um, before the 90 day mark. Um, so hopefully it will be issued by then. I want to point out, though, that in addition to new applications, we have closures to be processed. So there right. is a balancing there. Up. So there might be 76 new to be processed, but we also have 30 or 40 to be closed. So we can get that data for you as well to show that the impact isn't as great as it sounds off their 76 in queue to be opened. Right. And I mean, that's the data we need, I think, in analyzing that is, you know, what's been that, like, I said input and output, but that's not the right word. What's the, you know, Q and then what's the loss of units over time? Because it ha hasn't increased that much over time, um, but we want to know if there is a significant increase. Yeah, we can definitely pull that together. I know we looked at that during um, the COVID crisis when we saw um, right. additional applications coming in. But by the time you weigh out the new applications versus the closure, it wasn't a significant increase. Right. That's certainly helpful to know that we've got the closures. It's not quite as an alarming a number, but uh, uh, just from a policy standpoint, I don't believe it would be fair to change rules for people who are already in the application process, already in escrow. Uh, but are you, are you allowed to apply for a vacation rental permit if you're in escrow? You have to have title because if you submit an application but you're in escrow, it's very difficult to process because you can, most likely aren't going to have the insurance. We can't verify um, the ownership. This is where we look because we spend a lot of time verifying that they do not own any of the other vacation rentals. Even if it's in LLC or a trust, we ask for all members. We compare. Um, so it's a, that's why we have that 90-day processing period. It takes a lot of staff time. Um, and if you ex accept them during escrow, it just, it's an incomplete application. We don't have that information to verify. Thank you. I just wanted to say that to clarify. I think you were 
on the same page, Mayor, but I, for the public, I wanted to clarify that term of phrase. Um, I, I just, one thing I wanted to just comment on, I know we, we've, we've shifted, but I wanna go back a little bit to um, the gentrification discussion. Um, I think it's, it is, it is really telling, and, and those neighborhoods as well that, that Council Member Holstage mentioned um, are, are seeing changes. There, was a, there is a, a popular vacation rental in Desert Highlands Gateway Estates uh, that just sold for $1 million, and I, I have just been shocked to know that there is a house uh, in that area that sold for a million dollars, and it's traditionally been our most affordable um, area to live in. And but this vacation rental has been so popular that I, I imagine that it sold to somebody else who will probably, you know, continue to use it as a vacation rental. But to think that there's a vacation rental in that neighborhood that is so lucrative that someone can buy it for a million dollars and and. You know, I mean, that's that's quite shocking, um, which is why I would really like to see us use a percentage of the TOT that we get from vacation rentals to directly support our neighborhoods and our communities and and to support <coughs> housing. Um, you know, housing is not a human right. It, it should be, but it's not. And so we are in this situation where we do need the money that comes from things like this in order to um, provide housing subsidies and support because we cannot trust the market to allow for everyone to be housed. The market is a serious uh, failure, in, in my opinion, in terms of um, <laughs> allowing people to live with dignity, uh, not just in Palm Springs, but across our country. So I would like to, to see us really focus um, in our upcoming budget discussions about how we want to use that TOT funding to support our, our residents. Thank you, no one heard you. So no error there. Um, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> thank you, so I raised this publicly um, in this discussion about how to mitigate the impacts. I think not of just vacation rentals, but hotels as well, or anything generating TOT comes with jobs, often low wage work, um, or you know other impacts. And so one issue that our city is facing is that we don't have a dedicated revenue source for our housing fund. And we've publicly said that we're, we've spent almost all of our housing fund and we have a small amount left. And because the state took away redevelopment, you know, we don't see a, a revenue source there. So I had raised that and I agree um, looking at, you know, if we can set aside a portion of our TOT revenue or we could just set aside part of our general fund as a, you know, resolution from council knowing, you know, that, that every hotel we develop or vacation rentals that come online require a certain amount of jobs to be functional. And so it should be mitigated because we have to provide workforce housing in addition to uh, the economic development and other housing that we're doing. So um, a way to do that and make sure that they're really, we're getting getting there and, and providing workforce housing would be to do a set aside of TOT um, or an increase though they just did an increase so that we could have a revenue stream for our, t for our housing fund. It could be something else too. Um, council could just set aside it like we've done for road repairs or what have you. But I'm really supportive of finding um, an income stream for housing so we can develop workforce housing because at the end of the day, I know council's considering inclusionary zoning and other measures, um, but fundamentally this is a supply issue. Um, and we just need a significant amount more housing, especially workforce and um, middle income and low income. So I'm really supportive of, of doing that. And I'm wondering if, I know we scheduled out a few of our study sessions, but I'm hearing a lot of concern about the housing crisis, and I just want to make sure that we, they're related, but, you know, separate out or also discuss more deeply what are those tenant protections broadly, because I talked about tenant protections for vacation rentals, but broadly, right, what are those um, housing policies that we can bring forward, um, because it is a crisis for everyone, for all renters, even for cities that have no vacation rentals, um, you know, 
prices are still going up um, and it is a crisis. So I'd love to see us study those issues more in depth and really bring forward policy to protect tenants and find ha funding to develop new housing. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, a few years ago was to uh, prohibit an apartment from being uh, converted to a vacation rental. I, from a public policy standpoint, see uh, no reason why we could not extend that to single family homes that are being used in the rental market that uh, for long-term rental that uh, they cannot be uh, converted to uh, short-term rental. What we don't know is how many homes that would uh, impact and where those homes are. I, I, my sense is that is the kind of policy that would have broad support on council. And I think just getting, and it ties in with that, just what is really looking at right, what fits in ancillary use, right, a secondary use. And because um, we're not, other than the number of contracts, we're not really clear on that. And now that we know contracts are on average five days, it gives us a little more information. But looking at some options around that, right, because we don't want people buying homes in lower for Palm Springs price neighborhoods um, who are never going to use it because that is clearly not a secondary use of that house. It is the primary use of that house. And just, you know, thought a little bit about how we might do that, but just a little. So um, just, you know, thinking about that and for the city attorney because, you know, um, that's how our ordinance was able to stay is because it's not the primary use. It's not business first, it's someone's home that they're using first. And just thinking that through a little, and that could be something, you know, with some ideas that would be good to bring back. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, and I really think this is an important point to talk about the secondary use, because up until, I don't know, a month ago, I didn't know that, right? There are so many vacation rentals in our city that are they're businesses. This is, they are businesses. They advertise that way. Um, it is very clear. So if, I guess my question is how are we vetting it? Have we moved away from that? Have we, has it just become more difficult to figure out or is it just very easy to kind of loophole? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, And I, I'm also just curious if we do need to do anything in terms of further enforcement at all. For instance, um, there's four units that I saw recently um, that have vacation rental operations, but I believe four units are not allowed to have vacation rentals because they're considered an apartment. Right, but they're currently operating as a vacation rental, and I can I can <laughs> give more details on what, where that was and all of that to you later. But you know, do do you know Veronica and, and Patrick? Do do you need additional support in kind of figuring out things like that that are happening? Um, because I know that your team is working always working really hard to figure out this kind of stuff, but I don't know if it's if you need more support. We currently have one vacation um, rental compliance officer on staff who does search for um, unregistered vacation rentals. So it is very taxing. Um, he's also responsible for all the inspections for new vacation rentals and for renewals. So it is very taxing. I have a wonderful staff. They are phenomenal. They themselves will go online to assist to find unregistered rentals and give the tips to him. I mean, they're very hardworking, um, but it is difficult due to the amount um, out there that we know are happening. We do search more as festival season is approaching. This is one of the best times to look for unregistered rentals because you see new ads popping up all the time. Um, so it is difficult um, and some additional support would be helpful, I, I believe. Thank you so much. 
Now, one of the things that we've certainly seen uh, in the last few years is uh, enforcement and the commitment we've made to enforcement really does make a difference. Uh, that's both uh, our commitment, but also uh, the individuals who, uh, for the most part, are owning uh, vacation rentals in Palm Springs recognize uh, uh, that the rules are going to be enforced and therefore they're proactively uh, responding. And uh, uh, that makes all the difference in the world because problems are not uh, taking and emerging. Uh, I think what we're trying to do here is get some balances uh, correct. Uh, but I, I do want to go back to uh, something that uh, Councilmember Coor said, uh, uh, the, there is an economic impact. Uh, and it's not just simply that it produces revenue uh, that the city has. Uh, the number of visitors that we have coming into our community is creating jobs. It's creating uh, entrepreneurial opportunities for people to uh, open new businesses. We have. Uh, uh, we are receiving an incredible number of compliments from uh, practically everyone who's new coming into Palm Springs about how uh, vital and exciting our downtown is. And I think all of us take pride in that. And the full-time residents, we're getting opportunities to have choices in entertainment and culture that we would not have but for uh, this impact. So th there are benefits across the board, um, but uh, we've got to get uh, these things balanced in a way uh, that those benefits uh, are not uh, producing negative impacts on our community and on the ability of people to live in this community. Um, Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I just wanted to add that since we're discussing and studying the issue, um, one thing we had talked a little bit about um, people connected to the community. And I think about this in sort of future looking, like decades perspective, right? Because I know what we're seeing now, and this is a statewide housing crisis and we're impacted by other regions. So what I think we're seeing, and I love the data, whatever we can get, even just with from the realtors about trends, about who's buying, they probably have, um, you know, who's buying vacation rentals. Uh, CVEP maintains a lot of this data about the market. Um, but what I think you're seeing, at least I'll speak for my generation, is a lot of people who are in their 30s or, you know, early 40s who have collected, you know, who are able, who've saved some money, but cannot buy a home in the markets that they live, San Francisco, LA, coastal communities. And so what I think we're seeing is those people who do have a nest egg being, and they, you know, might be LG, LGBTQ, they might love Palm Springs, they might have various reasons for wanting to be here. Um, and then I, what I'm seeing um, is that they're often buying homes and then they can't afford it on their own, you know, just to have a second home along with their rental in the urban area they live. And so they're kind of investing in this way. And so I just want to not push back, but just talk about like the long-term ownership in Palm Springs and like the long-term residents and communities. And I think that's what we've seen over time, right? That's the trend is, but it's happening earlier because of the housing crisis and people just being totally pushed out of markets. And then now we're seeing with remote work, people being able to actually live here and come and go. So um, I just, I think it's, it's hard. It's really complex because we're so impacted by those housing markets. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, you know, yeah, I, 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 I'm so glad that council member cores that you, I think you pushed for the, uh, limit on not having multifamily. I think that was really smart public policy looking back. Cause I think we would have lost a lot of rental opportunities. Um, and just thinking through like how, how do we, you know, make sure and, and, and your limit on LLCs and actually knowing the true owner, um, and making sure it's not, you know, what we're seeing is real estate investment firms buying up huge swaths of some cities. We're not seeing that. So just thinking through, like, how do we know it's real people versus investors? But, um, but knowing that it doesn't have to be Palm Springs residents, because those are our future residents, and we have to think long-term like that in this market.
You know, if you go back uh, to the height of the uh, recession, uh, when there was just uh, numerous vacant homes uh, everywhere, and in state of significant disrepair, an awful lot of individuals, investors, came in, invested in the community. They've turned a very nice profit from what they've done, and there has been community benefit. Uh, but we're not in the midst of a significant recession today. We're in the opposite. And uh, uh, the value that uh, is brought to the community simply from having folks who do not plan to live here at all uh, isn't as great as it was uh, a dozen years ago. Uh, and I think it's appropriate for us to take measures today uh, that uh, in this kind of market that uh, uh, prejud that uh, places a preference on those who are going to be uh, spending uh, at least some significant part of each year living here in Palm Springs. Council Member Kors. No, I think that's a good point. And also, you know, when, the re when that recession hit, you know, the first people sort of to walk away were people who were able to walk away from their homes without a consequence, right? Because they were so underwater. And mm -hmm. there were some full-time residents, but sort of the second homes that really mm -hmm. impacted us, right? Um, you know, people who lived here still tried to figure out how to make it work. Um, so, I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting conversation. I do agree, you know, and it is related to this. Uh, committing to you know, figuring out how we're gonna build like workforce and attainable housing, not just officially low-income housing, but attainable housing. And that can be done you know, with minimum 30-day rentals, right? We've done that on some projects um, where you can't make it a vacation rental, right? Moving forward, I think there's really an opportunity to set some policy on what we wanna do moving forward um, that I think could really have a positive impact. So. Um, it's related, but not this exact question. But I do think from a policy, it's not just money. And without money, we're not going to have that kind of housing because you have to give incentives. And we have to f try and figure that out. But it's also the policy that, that those housing that is supported that way can't be used as vacation rentals because that, um, and I don't think there'd be a lot of pushback on that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing we definitely um, can look at. And just from, you know, for the city attorney, um, you know, as you think a little bit about you know, what really gets us into an ancillary use. Um, and just making sure we have some way where even letting people know, right? Like, you know, we, it, is, it, it is that you're gonna be u utilizing this house. Um, whether you're renting it out six months of the year in a, a part-term rental, that's still using it primarily for something other than short-term vacation rentals and just thinking thinking that through, because I, I agree with you. People, there's a lot of discussion, but that's five years ago. Uh, and really thinking through how that would work, I think it will be helpful. Good. Certainly. So maybe for council member cores or maybe for staff. So when the, I'm trying to remember back in 2017, it's been a while. So I know it wasn't on council. So. <clears throat> the reason that the number of total contracts was chosen is sort of the limit on use versus the number of days or amount of time. Yeah. Can you describe that? And then um, I heard you say that you pushed for 26. Yeah. Could you just clarify for, the, sure. for us I and mean, everyone? The, the, the idea of doing it by contracts, which I don't think anyone else had done at that point, was... Um, you're not renting it out, you know, 52 weekends a year, right? Which mm -hmm. was impacting residents. And also meant you weren't really using it if you if it was getting rented out three-day weekends or two-day weekends almost every week. So 26, half, half the weeks, um, seemed like the right number. Uh, various reasons that there wasn't support uh, for that. And, you know, signature gathering that stopped an ordinance from getting into effect and negotiations and trying to get both sides to a compromise, which came very close, but one still brought a ballot measure. Uh, but that was the goal of that, right? To come up with uh, this uh, way of looking at it. So that, that was the thought, as opposed to, you know, some cities have done 90 days or 180 days. Mm -hmm. But if you're only renting out every weekend and you're letting it sit vacant all week, that wasn't 
that helpful. Yeah, it's interesting. Thanks. Are we to a point of trying to summarize for uh, staff our broad areas of agreement or yeah, investigation we or ask staff to yeah, read for us? That would be much faster. Ask them to read back to us. Thank you. So, Mayor and Council, um, I've been keeping a few notes as we go, and they're not in any particular order at this point. I haven't had time to categorize them, but. Um, uh, we have the issue of further exploring secondary versus ancillary use um, and maybe a couple of ideas that have been tossed out. I won't get into some of the specifics because that gets into my notes, but just um, a variety of ways that we might look at that issue. Um, more data on the impact of housing, which really may be something more like a housing study. We could glean some anecdotal evidence from surrounding communities and things, um, but really a lot of this um, relates to understanding housing, housing problem and housing strategies, um, addressing or at least examining concentration, um, look uh, potentially into prohibiting people from um, renting within a certain time if it's been previously occupied by a long-term rental tenant. So again, kind of housing-related policy. Um, these notes would need to be cleaned up, right? But, but some I'm hearing specific ideas and some are just broader concepts. Um, keeping our enforcement efforts robust and perhaps looking at ways that we might assist the department so that their resources can be directed towards that effort and other administrative efforts. Looking at long-term data with the housing market. Um, again, what's really driving cost, um, you know, second home ownership versus vacation rentals, et cetera. Um, increasing supply, which is slightly separate, but understanding how vacation rentals uh, impact that issue. Um, other tenant protections, which is again, venturing a little into housing. Um, examining kind of a public process where we want to have um, active engagement from stakeholders from a variety of perspectives on this issue, likely coming together in a working group but soliciting input more broadly than just a working group. Um, it, looking at other strategies that might be on the periphery but things like assigning a TOT or other sources for housing. Um, looking at issues with unregistered rentals if we still have any of those. Uh, and I think that broadly kind of encapsulates, there's, there's a lot of smaller nuance within that that I think we would want to explore some of the specific policy suggestions. But, but really, it's um, secondary ancillary use, housing impacts, um, and a lot of engagement with stakeholders to kind of vet more thoroughly our policy options. Uh, that sounds uh, good uh, to me. Uh, I think the one area that... Uh, we really need to take a look at is uh, making sure that we do not set off a uh, surge in uh, people purchasing homes and trying to get in before uh, any changes are made. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I also wanted to just offer support to Councilmember Holstage's comments about wanting to have a study session on housing and obviously Justin you you just does you know mention that I think several times throughout um, I, I do support that and I think it would be there's a lot of things that we could go into tonight that I think we all kind of avoided going into too many details and but obviously it's a really needed discussion uh, I'm, Council let me just offer Halston. quickly on yes. that point if I may um, I did take the liberty of kind of looking at some of our work plans and our four-month summary. We did anticipate that this conversation would likely continue to another meeting or two. Um, depending on how robust the engagement is, that might be a little broader. And then within the housing topic, we do have a number of things that are segues to the conversation, perhaps not at the scale of, of another study session, but... Um, you know, housing element and some other conversations that are on the agenda for the four month time frame, and then budget conversations as well, where we'll look at sources and uses and, and financing. And so, somewhere on that near horizon, I do think those items would coalesce into something of the scale of a uh, uh, study session to kind of look holistically at that topic. Councilmember Halstead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I do think they're related because I think it's 
easy to attribute the housing crisis just to vacation rentals or even assume that – I just don't want to make assumptions. I really want to know, you know, between housing impacts and, and this whole conversation. And it's we're not going to be able to piece it and say it's 25 percent of the impact, but, you know, have more information than what we do now while we're legislating that. Um, with this summary, I just wanted to add one more thing. If there's support from council, um, I heard uh, Council Member Coors and Mayor Middleton talk about TO impacts and tourism and jobs and so just want to think through like tourism data because I think we're in this situation you know respectfully to our neighboring cities is that we know that the Coachella Valley doesn't have enough hotel rooms for you know large festivals and events and seasons and so we do rely on vacation rental stock unless we develop a lot more hotels um, but there's you know it's a seasonality thing and so understanding like what is the overall demand demand for uh, units, you know, um, to understand, you know, and, and how that's impacting the demand in Palm Springs, because, you know, we could do it overall in the Coachella Valley. What I'm concerned is seeing all these cities take, in my opinion, extreme measures to ban um, or do moratoriums um, really, really significant and significantly increases the demand for vacation rentals in Palm Springs. And that's what scares me is, you know, are we going to have to fill that, um, fill that gap and we just don't have the housing stock to do it. So I would ask if council supports that, um, including a conversation on tourism and data from the CVB, which council member of course chairs, um, to understand what that demand and supply side is for tourism. And that's actually being studied right now, um, and I think per city. So yeah. uh, there's some of that data initially, but um, we won't have to do that study, Justin. So, study. so um, I think that that may helpful. <laughs> uh, so you know, anyone who knows we're having this conversation, I I think it also have the opposite effect, right? Yeah. Because some cities, you know, that have banned vacation <coughs> rentals, you know, you had a year and then you were banned. So if you're looking to buy it primarily as a vacation rental. Just this conversation is gonna keep some people off. Um, but we should just be conscious if a conversation about a moratorium, um, which is a fine conversation, probably should be first some high level outreach with the realtors to sort of get their sense. Because um, when um, I wasn't one of them, but two council members brought that in 2017. Yeah. And we had about four hours of public comment, um, people waiting outside. Yeah. Um, and they decided it was not a good idea. Um, so just so we have, you know, some outreach maybe to, you know, the head of the board of the Realtors Association and um, a couple conversations and get, just so people can weigh in. Because, um, and 200 people applied for permits thinking they needed to get in under the wire if they want to ever rent their house out. Yeah. Um, so um, I do think we want, we need some window to talk. So I appreciate the desire, but I think we should have that conversation that we need some window. Other, so we're not doing anything quick to right, avoid that situation, but I think maybe some conversations might be helpful if that is good, or you know, we can bring it back for discussion and you know, ask the organizations you know, as a, like a little mini study session for a half hour only before a council meeting or something, where we have some folks you know, who are the heads of the organizations just that we can have a conversation with or something. I'm just trying to think how we can have that conversation in a way that doesn't cause um, I think that kind a, of experience. That kind of conversation as soon as possible would yeah. be very helpful. Uh, I hope the public is taking away from the conversation that we've had today that uh, we're trying to uh, act tactically and act in a fashion that uh, uh, is, uh, is balanced. We're not uh, trying to make radical change here in any direction. Yeah. And um, just a suggestion, if it's good, that maybe given you worked a lot on this when you were head of 1PS uh, during that year, but um, whether it's Justin, whose plate is full or your plate is full, you know, maybe having a couple of those conversations, um, you know, with the realtors and some others to just get a sense on how we can have this window and start talking about a working group. So they, you know, we're not talking about, a, no one's mentioned the word ban or anything along those lines, right? We're not looking to do something that wholesale. I haven't heard anyone go near that. But I think that was part of the concern before too, right? Where could this go? Because uh, there was a very active group 
in 2017 really pushing a ban. And so I think that caused some of the concern. Mm -hmm. But I, let's ha at least have that, not spring it on folks and have that conversation and then before we bring anything back to council like that, which can be very quick, right? It could be in a meeting or two. Seems to me we're talking about how do we uh, grow sensibly and grow in a, in a measured way. Yeah. Is that uh, personal or just um, emotionally? We all need to grow sensibly. <laughs> <laughs> If we're no. done at 7.15, we feel like we've, we've, we've grown in how we run our meetings, so that's good. Now, uh, you know, I think all of us were, uh, and I'm glad that Council Member Holstead added to Muth Park. I missed that uh, to the list. What we saw is in the last, uh, in the first part of this past decade, there was a tremendous amount of growth in some pretty uh, popular uh, neighborhoods, but because of the recession, they were very accessible in the last half of uh, this decade. The growth has been in uh, communities that have traditionally been our most accessible neighborhoods, and that's, that's a policy concern moving forward. I mean, there's some neighborhoods that were built for full-time residents and some that were more built for vacation rentals, and those were mm -hmm. the ones that were accessible for a period right. um, that are much tougher now, right? So, good point. Right. We have, uh, do you have the direction you need? I, we have the direction we need. Yeah. All right. Uh, one of the questions uh, Justin did have to do with uh, timing. Uh, when do you expect to, to come back to us uh, uh, with uh, recommendations? I'd like to visit with our team a little bit and think about a schedule for a working group. These are somewhat larger topics, right? Especially when you get into something like a variety of policies that might reinforce this as an ancillary use. And, and so I, I'd like to visit with the team and think about how many times we might need to work with a working group, but it takes a little while to compose one thoughtfully that is balanced in perspectives and diverse so that we get a, a robust conversation that hopefully is reflective of the broader tension we have in the community with this conversation so that the kinds of compromises that might be made at that table are, are likely to also resonate with people on multiple sides of the issue more broadly. Um, and for them to meet a handful of times and come back, I mean, that's, that's probably a, a few months to, to really do this thoughtfully. There might be some things we do in the meantime. For instance, we heard about um, maybe getting some perspective from realtors on any emerging trends or current trends uh, in the market so that we know if there's any other temporary measures that might be needed. So we might have some touch points there. But, and, and then we would also have to decide whether or not to bring this back in bits and pieces as the working group is completing uh, its, its work or whether or not to bring you a, a complete set of recommendations. So we, we'd need to think that through, um, but needless to say, it wouldn't be at an, either of the, the next two or three or any, any of the next two or three or, or four meetings likely as we assemble that group and get started. Great. Is there anything further? Then uh, we will adjourn until our next regular city council meeting on April 7, 2022. A reminder to the public that in April we're meeting on the first and third Thursdays instead of our normal second and fourth uh, Thursdays. Uh, we are adjourned until 5.30 uh, April 7. <laughs>